Angel List. How many of you have been on Angel List? Okay. How many of you have been a part of a company that's put a, a profile up on Angel List? How many of you have an individual profile up on Angel List? All right. For those of you who haven't seen Angel List, all right. This is me. Oh wait, Scotty, you're not out of this yet. Okay, so. Basically what you see is a profile of me and they've now added background pictures like everyone else so I can personalize my page. Is that the, the same shirt you're wearing today? Uh, no, it's actually, this one has a collar. Uh, it's got all of the companies that I've invested in, companies where I'm on the board of directors of, uh, a little bit of background of, of Exceed, our, our venture fund and the firms we've invested in, et cetera. Um, Yin actually said, lied and said nice things about me, so I've got a, a, a reference. But it's not just me. We have our other intrepid instructor, Scotty, who's the CEO at Slice, and a little bit about his background as well. Okay? And there were some good uh, explanations in the back. I'm going to turn this off. And while I do that, it is my great pleasure to introduce our two guests, Kevin Lodge and Ash Fontana, two of the senior executives from AngelList. Please join me in welcoming them. <laughs> Now, Kevin in particular has been hugely helpful. He coordinated with all of the teams. Uh, your parents are on the faculty at the University of Michigan, is that correct? Uh, no, Dickinson College. Dickinson, okay, so I, and a very, very strong uh, appreciation of the academic environment. He's been helpful to several members of the faculty in looking at data here at the GSB, and we're very appreciative that he let us write this case. And so thank you to you both for all the time that you spent with us. All right, let's uh, get started here. We'll start with some facts from the case, and then I want to drill down into some specific issues. We'll probably go for till about 4.15 or so and then we'll turn you over to them where they can comment on the feedback from all of you and you can fire questions at them and they're inf far infinitely more interesting than Scott and I are. But let's start first about AngelList. It began as a blog, Venture Hacks, right? Naval was helping his buddy uh, trying to figure out how do you raise money? What do you do? How do you ask questions? How do you get introductions? They were trying to make things more transparent. The venture industry has a history of being very opaque. No one really knows what's going on. Nobody knows what the numbers are and what the returns are. And the team at Angel has tried to kind of break down those barriers. By July 2011, there had been 8,000 introductions made online and about 400 investments made. And that was just even all the ones that you were able to figure out. There might, in fact, have been others since not everyone did everything online at the time. The goal was to try to automate the process of investing. If you hear Naval tell the story, he believes that there's horrific inefficiencies in the market, and the whole team at AngelList believes this. And if you look at that first dollar that starts maybe at a fund of funds or a university endowment, and you watch it go through from the LPs to the GPs to finally to the entrepreneur, there's the tax that's taken off along the way through management fees and the like. And what if you could actually just get that dollar directly into the entrepreneur's pocket? Wouldn't that be more efficient and effective? That's what AngelList is trying to make happen. No transaction fees. They're going to make money in this side of their business through performance base. If the companies do well, they'll make money on the upside. So that's actually a very interesting thing. They're going to put their money where their mouth is. They're only going to make money if the companies that get funded through AngelList actually do well. By September of 2013, they raised $24 million. If I got the facts in the case right, the valuation was $150 million plus or minus is what was reported to the outside world, and there were 100 plus investors. A lot of little checks, kind of like a syndicate. It was. It was, it was a syndicate. There you go. The reason they were there is we raised it on AngelList. And let's talk about syndicates, right? Syndicates, this notion that if you're a good <laughs> investor, you can actually get the masses to put money behind you. Everybody can be a general partner. Everybody can be a venture capitalist. If you've got good deal flow, you'll win. By April, $28 million had been invested through syndicates. There had been 72 different actual syndicates that had been done. Actually, one of our portfolio companies, one that Scott and I invested in together, did a syndicate, Zero Secure. Uh, they closed a few hundred thousand dollars on Angela. So we actually got to see it from the other side. Um, VCs were trying it. The folks at Foundry, you know, they are going to do a syndicate. Everyone's going to get in and try this, right? You read, I think it was Ryan's quote or Brad's quote in the case. And it's like every VC was talking about it. They were actually going to get behind it and try it. And finally, startups can self-syndicate. You find 100 grand, you can go up onto AngelList and see if you can get everybody else to come along the way for you. Anything else I missed in the case in terms of key facts that caught your attention? 
Zane? Yeah, I mean, I think the hiring pipeline was a pretty key add-on, and um, I think that could be some vehicle for growth in the future that could be ah. the LinkedIn to the world. Interesting, huh? There's, you know, there was a quote in the case that some of the best people that have been hired were people who were found through AngelList. As a venture capitalist, I'll tell you that's 110% true. Most of our portfolio companies hire aggressively through AngelList. There was another hand over here, Sergey. Was at the point you were going to make, or somebody had their hand up? Okay. Any other key facts before we get into the case? Tim? It might be something around the carry, how the how carry versus transaction. I think that was an important fact in terms of how they, they got it. They were able to get around regulation and regulatory issues because they were not, since it wasn't a transaction based uh, uh, business that they were trying to build, that the SEC said no action. Very interesting. Amir? But it is still a concern that it could be. The great thing about the government is it's not a concern until the government says it's your concern. <laughs> All right. All right. If you're the leadership team of AngelList, is this a good business opportunity? Hey, are they really going to be able to build a big business? They're making $2,000 you know, per every hire that's done. That's not very much compared to what recruiters make. They're going to have a very, very small part of the carry of these very, very small things. Is this a good business? What do you think? John? I think it is. I mean, they made a comment in there that it was more or less a kind of a Silicon Valley, almost local model for the time being. But I, I just see that as scalability. I mean, if you took this model, I don't know whether substitutes or, or uh, competitors are out there, but if you took this model national, global, I mean, I, I think it's scale. OK. John thinks it's a good business. Who else? Yeah. It delivers a lot of value. The question is, can people take that off the platform? It seems like mm -hmm. the fact that like a lot of these these recruiting, the, a lot of the hiring happens off platform, and then you have to like send an email to make sure that they actually send it, and they have to get a confirmation. It's sort of a, a, a pain in the butt to try to scale that. How sticky is it? If they just start emailing directly, you know, maybe they won't get their carry, and maybe they have to follow up. And it's taking longer to get syndicates done and closed than it is. Even the VCs are moving more quickly because AngelList has forced them to behave better. Is this a good business? Other thoughts? Ralph? I think so. I mean, essentially, they're in the business of putting resources into the hands of entrepreneurs, whether that's money, people, funding. Um, and you can use it as a platform to extend upon, right? So you can have other resources like legal support, which is already in there, or maybe marketing in the future. So they're building an infrastructure which you can use to keep, in, keep expanding on your business. So they can add to it. OK. Uh, in the back, Marco. So I think it's a good business, though. Like, uh, I think it's a long-term one, especially when we think about carry. Uh, it will take a while to prove the model and make sure that you're going to have like success like cases. So if it takes a long time, is that good or bad? So from a cash perspective, I think it's bad. But uh, I think it would like, demand some time to, to have a track record. Uh, that would like show the success of the platform. They took money from certain venture capitalists. Venture capitalists have timelines. If this is going to be a long-term win, are they going to feel pressure from the VCs to get some money out? I think so. Oh, so maybe you're not so concerned it's a good business. Yeah. There was a hand up here or no? Was that? Maybe uh, AngelList is a is not uh, so so cash, but it, it increased the number of, of companies and they they boost the the talent or the LinkedIn business. So it gets a lot of people starting companies. It's going to allow more people to be entrepreneurial on a global basis, right? And we'll see that on Thursday with 500 startups, right? They're democratizing the system. Clement. If you can be the first player to set up a platform, there's network effects and benefits. You think of LinkedIn, you think of Facebook. Once that's established, there are other revenue streams available to you. Um, I wouldn't take transaction fees off the table long term. Okay. So they've got first mover advantage. Sergey. Yeah, I would, uh, I would agree that that's a good business because if you build the platform, then you can use this platform for other types of crowd, crowdsourcing, like uh, retail. Uh, like retail investors and so on. We can crowdsource engineers. We can crowdsource marketing. We can crowdsource any sort of things we want to fill because they're going to have knowledge as to who's on it. Yeah, but at the same time, I doubt that there's the, the business model is good because uh, actually, I mean, um, if you think what 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 they sell, they sell some some other person's time. 
they save some other person's time. I can hire the analy uh, uh, some analyst, and this analyst will uh, look for companies for me, right? So when I'm uh, doing this deal on this platform, I'm just saving my time. So why should I pay carry for that? I'm ready to pay subscription fee for that, but not carry, and it's different. Mm. What makes a good venture capitalist? What makes a good investor? Let's even just kind of divorce it for that. What makes a good investor? Mark? Good deal flow. Good deal flow. So wouldn't that argue that if you get good deal flow, people should get some carry for it? Well, the, the, the thing about AngelList is it's so disruptive and new that there are some concerns about negative signaling, that if, if you can't raise your money the traditional way through Silicon Valley, right. you know, is, is AngelList your last resort? You would call Andreessen Horowitz or Innovation Endeavors or Sequoia, you have to go to AngelList? It becomes like the drags. Is that, so that's what you're saying. Not so good. It's going to be, oh, I don't want to fund companies there. If they were really good, they'd have intros to the best of the best. Eric? Yeah, another reason why it could be not so good is that if you took the VC seed investment overall portfolio returns, mm -hmm. it's not actually that high. Mm -hmm. So if, if at scale you have every single seed investment of a VC on AngelList, it, the you know, weighted average is actually not that great of a return. Interestingly enough, the data would show according to certain investors and certain LP groups, that seed investors, if you can get an early buy ownership and hold on to your ownership level, can actually be some of the most lucrative. But you've got to be able to hold on and maintain yourself so that you don't get washed out over time. Right? So if somebody doesn't negotiate those rights, the right to maintain interest, the right to keep investing, you might in fact get washed out and that could hurt you. Depends on what's negotiated, but we'll actually ask the two of them when we go to the debrief. Elaine, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was going to add, throw up two more concerns for the no side. Okay. Um, one, it strikes me that it's a very cyclical business, so they're, you know, focusing on very small investments and, and the sort of, uh, the stuff that goes away as soon as the economy goes south. And In the then, times of great happiness, like the end of the 90s and even maybe a little bit now, it's wonderful when like asset prices are going like this. And when asset prices go like this, angel list could be at risk. Yeah, I'm not going to invest my $1,000. OK. And then the, the second has been mentioned, but the regulatory risk. I think at, at the current scale, maybe you can you know, rely on your SEC letter. But as soon as you get big enough for the government to start caring about you, then you're going to have to start thinking about being a broker dealer or something else. OK. Anything else on this? David. Um, for me, they're, they're a broker in a very big industry where the other brokers uh, charge way too much uh, and their cost structure is uh, less. It's something we've seen online. Some of the best businesses are ones where they broker to two different markets and that's how I see AngelList. So you're using broker with a lowercase b. They're not officially a broker. In fact, the SEC said they're not a broker. So they're basically just disintermediating the market. All right, show of hands. How many think this is going to be a big business over time? How many, of you, how many of you say no? Well, actually, why not? I'm just worried that people can bypass this angel list to the point that you made earlier. Uh, the two ways in which they make revenue, from what I understand, is uh, matching investors to the, the people who want the money, and secondly, access to resources like you know, good, high-quality engineers. My worry is that there's ways to circumvent angel list, and that way you don't actually carry any carry or any revenues. So eventually they're going to get washed out. Suzuki-san, why is this a bad business? Well, I'm not saying it's gonna, it doesn't make a big money, but <clears throat> my point is their biggest contribution is to change the structure of the, the how it works. So I, I respect what they make to change the whole structure of the, they open the window to the vast majority of the business. So for me, it's much more interesting. So. It's interesting because it changes things, but are they going to make money? Udit's jumping in there. I saw the hand go up. Well, I'm just skeptical on, is this a good way to allocate capital in the market? Just have a lot of people just pl place tons of bets in many different places. What's to like say this is an efficient way to 
dole out money in the VC world. So you don't think this is a good business? This is going to be the uneducated, unsophisticated investors are going to lose a lot of money on this. It's potentially it could. They could all have bet on multiple pieces and it lands on something else and it unravels. That's what happens when you do risky investments. Risha? I really like the idea. I don't like the way they are trying to monetize it because I fear it becoming like Craigslist. If instead they could be the LinkedIn, so like for premium access, they could start charging people. Um, so then I see a lot of money coming in for them. But isn't that what they did with syndicates? And we'll hold, you know, we'll, we'll talk about syndicates more in a second. But isn't that what they were trying to do? Trying to get the really high quality people to aggregate more capital and really become venture capitalists? Yes, yeah, so if they're like asking for access, in that case also they were like still charging transaction from my understanding. Uh -huh. If they're like charging for just for access, uh -huh. so playing the small game but the volumes game, okay. then I think it's a better one. All right, so David and then uh, I'm gonna move on to the next topic, go ahead. I think it's only a matter of time before equity investment um, isn't just a matter of uh, accredited investors, and that's starting with the Jobs Act, but they're going to be really in the, in the best place out of anyone to capitalize on that. AngelList is going to be in the best place of that. Yeah, we'll talk about Maiden Lane in a, as we get to the end of this discussion. Let's shift gears here. If I'm a venture capitalist, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Are you destroying the way that I put food on the table for my children? Yeah, absolutely. Hell yeah. Pow! Really? If I'm a VC, is this a good thing or a bad thing? They're hoping to put me out of business. Mark? Well, well kind of two, two points. Well, one, it's disruptive in terms of it's taking away that, that nice management fee that, that you probably really enjoy. Um, <laughs> on my humongous seed fund. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but on, the, on the other end, it, Angelus is also a great way to kind of top off a round. So maybe you want to get to two million, you raise 1.5, you can go you know, top off the round through Angelus. So it could be a pretty powerful tool for VCs as well. So it could be a source of capital. Interesting. Ken in the back, you had your hand up. I'll get to you next, John. Good. Uh, some of the traditional VCs may also lose their ability to, to lock down the deals when they find a good company to invest in. Yeah. This thing might take away my deal flow, especially if you get, you know, Carl Jacob was an example of somebody in the case. Carl's got phenomenal deal flow. If Carl's doing other stuff and he's not bringing me his deals and he's doing them himself, oh well, my goodness, I'm losing my deals. So this is bad. You know, I'm going to lose my uh, proprietary deal flow which every venture capitalist says they have. John, you had a, your hand up. Yeah, my guess is that the uh, top venture capitalist firms aren't too worried about it for some of the reasons that Mark mentioned, just in terms of like being a second or third option. And my guess is that it's also like a place where cash is going to flow in when times are good and flow out of when times are bad more than other places. And so it's going to kind of be, while other venture capital firms are more stable, it's going to kind of be like, see swings more. So I, I don't really think that they're too worried about it. This is just fashion. It's, you know, during when times are good, it's all good. But then, you know, as soon as the stock market crashes, and it will, then we'll still be standing and there'll be nobody to put money into deals on, on Angelus. So I shouldn't really worry about it as long as I hold my own and I'm steady and I stay, stay the course as a venture capitalist. Like it might be kind of almost a canary um, that venture capitalists can use to see like when things are getting bubbly and like there's lots of unsophisticated money coming in or when Ooh. money's coming out or it's a source of data phil you had your hand up i think it helps uh bridge the gap between super seed stage companies and seed stage like uh i'd say structured investing or sophisticated investors so yeah i mean help guys who just need 250 grand get off the ground and then you know we'll structure the deal. Let a uh, a large seed stage fund come in, or a larger seed stage fund come in after that. So I think it's a great tool to grow small ideas on a small level. It's deal flow for us. Yeah, it, it is deal flow, and it's actually it's a vetted deal flow. In fact, it's even better deal flow because you're able to um, you're, you're not actually stealing anything out of a proprietary deal flow right. basket. You're actually just uh, procuring that even even better by giving guys a chance to go run with 200 grand or 300k, and if they don't make it with that, then you know maybe uh, maybe that's a good indicator of whether or not you should be investing in them. All right, question for our two friends from AngelList: What's the average size deal that gets done through AngelList? So the typical round on AngelList is like a one and a half mil seed round. <laughs> And a syndicate will usually contribute between 300 to 500k of that seed round. Okay. That's the typical average deal that gets done. 
we obviously see uh, much bigger deals get done. So I did like a 50 mil Series C on AngelList recently. And like we do, we do see some later stage stuff, but it's still very early. Okay, so 20% 20, 20 to a third of a standard seed round is coming from AngelList. Yeah. Okay. Jesse, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you look over the long term, I'm not sure exactly how, but the inefficiencies of like say Sand Hill Road, like that you would go and pitch to individuals like in this kind of old boys network that they called it. Like that doesn't make sense as the internet has disrupted all these other markets. Like then I think it's just a matter of time before information and the internet kind of disrupts that you're gonna go down a single street and give a pitch so inefficiently to these people who are the experts to give you capital. And I think just over time, whether or not they're able to capture that value, um, like I think that's difficult to figure out how in the short term, but like over the long term, I think that VCs, it's going to look totally different in the future because of things like AngelList. So there's the quote from the entrepreneur on page four, where traditionally I had to dedicate a block of time to fundraise full time. I can now fundraise passively. Is that good or bad? Does that mean the entrepreneur's lazy? Does that mean the investor is lazy? Yeah, click. I'll invest there, click, I'll invest there. Is this goodness or is this like, oh, this is gonna lead to bad things? Zane? Uh, it just fundamentally calls into question, what are you getting out of that investment crew? Um, in the Blue River case, we saw how kind of partnering with KV, partnering with the node sort of you know, transformed the business. And that could happen with really quality venture capitalists, really quality angel investors as well. If you're just clicking and gathering a syndicate of 100 investors, you may get that, but you have to go out of your way to still develop that relationship, and then you go back to what you were doing before AngelList. Um, I, I don't think it's as revolutionary from that standpoint. Matt? I think if you're a diligent entrepreneur and you're really focused on capital, which is the most critical thing that your business needs to grow, um, I think being a passive investor or a passive fundraiser is probably a pretty negative sign because it's somebody that just doesn't really think about the, it, you know, its most precious resource. But come on. I mean, as a venture capitalist, I don't add any value. In fact, I know mostly I get in the way. Same thing with Scott, right? What he does at Innovation Endeavors when he's there, when he's not running his company. I mean, what do we really do? It's the entrepreneurs who are the stars and the heroes. What do they need us for? Why not just make it passive? Or do I, or do I actually add value? I know that's what my web page says. <laughs> Philippe? Yeah, but I think you, you can stop them to make a bad business. I mean, if you, if you need to go uh, send him road door by door, reaching yourself, it's a good way to assess from an outside perspective if your business is good or not. So, and making the, the money easier, well, maybe you don't have this funnel or Okay. Assessment. I'm not sure Alex agrees on that. Well, actually, I was going to say to back that up a little bit um, <laughs> is that just from a startup that I worked, worked for before, that every time the founders came back from meetings with investors, it did spark important conversations that we weren't getting hard. We weren't, we weren't being attacked in the same way we were when we were trying to go get money from people. And there's something about trying to get, extract money from people that really makes them look harder at what you're doing. Now, sometimes I think that took us down bad paths for sure, but there are others that times when it was invaluable. So I think you're potentially going to miss that that kind of relationship when you're going online. He wants to crush my business. Dave McClure, when we when he's here on Thursday, is going to talk about and use some colorful metaphors about die VC die. Why? Because it's not transparent. They're, they're getting all the garbage out of the way and allowing the money to flow straight through. So you actually, VCs actually do something? Don't, look at all the nice art that's in the lobbies of all these things on Sand Hill Road. It's a waste of money, isn't it? These management fees, they're egregious. Actually, I also think it probably matters when somebody is, what stage they are as an entrepreneur. Uh -huh. So if I'm third, fourth, fifth company, it sounds fantastic. But if I'm a, like some random kid out of Stanford, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing, how, there might be value in that, but you could also be taken advantage of really easily. So it's... Right. We'll Arlo. Ahead. But in the beginning, you need to spend your time to build your product. So how can you build your product if you're dealing with all the fundraising? 
So passive is great on that standpoint because fundraising is so that you can build this company, but if you're spending all your time fundraising, how can you actually build something great? Especially so if, you're, if you're a student with I can time. focus on the product. Don't have to waste my time with those slimy scum sucking VCs. Oh, yeah. uh, hold on, there were some, uh, Jonathan. My friend, uh, I think you don't have to worry about it and your list because if you think about the stock market, we already have a fully automated uh, trading system, but large institutional investors still you know, in interview the CEOs and visit the uh, factories and examine the inventories because there is a, always there is a information asymmetry mm -hmm. between the small investors and the large investors. So I think VCs can focus on the large investment uh, rather than the uh, small crowdfunding. All right, Laura first, then we'll go to Constantine. I think the whole conversation, we've been focusing on the pros and cons of the individual who is aware of which doors and it has the ability to go door to door and the pluses and minuses on that. But I think the original vision, my understanding the intention, disrupting this old boys club and the transparency, there's a benefit on both sides, VC and otherwise giving life to potential entrepreneurs that, you know, far reaches of the world or at a certain young age have no awareness of this entire system. So my question then on that, as I switch over here, as an entrepreneur, do you like or dislike AngelList? I think it's your, it depends on your motivation in terms of getting the funding. If you were really focused on looking to partner and get insights with a specific venture capital firm or individual, it might not be your best route if you already know that and have access. If not, which is probably a large percentage of people, then this is fantastic for you. Just give me the money and leave me alone. Let me go run my business. Aaron? Well, I, I do think, especially as a, more of a, maybe a group that doesn't fit your typical entrepreneurship, you know, sort of Stanford, young male engineer that might be the better way to go so it's good for older women not from stanford <laughs> <laughs> i just kind of went to the opposite of what you said right. yeah i do think it op it levels a playing field for people getting funding levels a playing field from the people who aren't in the loop right now and is that going to be a good source of of returns long term or do we not know Hmm. As an entrepreneur, do I like this, Sebastian? I would say that entrepreneurs mostly lag in the list because they are eliminating a lot of friction and also information asymmetries, particularly for those entrepreneurs who have no experience at all. So what information are you going to get as an entrepreneur on AngelList that you won't get elsewhere? No, basically I'm talking about the information asymmetry that exists when you're dealing with a VC and you are a kind of rookie entrepreneur who are building for first time with a very experienced VC. Uh, I think sometimes uh, it's like there is a kind of imbalance in, the, in that relationship. You, Laura, and Aaron kind of made a similar point. Maybe it's good if you're an unsophisticated entrepreneur. Tomas? I think even if you are sophisticated from Stanford, young, beautiful, it has you. <laughs> I didn't want to make the point that strong, but I, I know that's okay. Uh, it has your optionality, so you like it. It's like, it's like another option, you can top around, or you can just go to Angelis. Like, it's another option. Stacey, your hand went up as soon as I put that up on the board. Yeah, I think it's interesting because they, if you are an experienced entrepreneur, you're actually more incentivized to do this because you already have the connections that you see with others or anything on the at that point. So, and the rookies benefit because they're in the same mix as the experienced guys. So if the experienced guys are angelists, then that, then that says angelists is not the very right, so not the VC world, and then the rookies benefit. So I think everyone can. So it's a barbell, actually. If I, the really experienced people should go there because they don't have to deal with all the crap of dealing with the VCs, and they already have their connections. And the rookies can go there because they can actually get some introductions maybe to some interesting people. Yeah. What about the people in the middle? Good for them or not? Well, they like it because, because the, the high-end companies are in the mix, or the high-end entrepreneurs, then you can't necessarily tell who's who right away. So they like to be in that mix. OK. All right. 
Fanod? Uh, more of a question, really. So it says in the case that the syndicates are curated or uh, yeah. validated. What about the backers? Are they all vetted? Uh, my, my, is there a risk of me as an entrepreneur going there, getting an um, assurance from someone that I'll get this amount of money, and then not yeah, it. there's no guarantee that money's in your in the bank until it's in your bank. That's also true with VCs. VCs sometimes sign term sheets and don't close deals. So that risk happens both ways. Deepti? I just wanted to say, so if you form a relationship with the VC during tough times, like the Skybox case, mm -hmm. where they suddenly needed more money uh, you know, to get bridge financing, they could go back. In such a case, how, how would you do that? We'll ask the guys when we do our, our debrief, we'll ask the two of them to actually speak to that. But what about during tough times? Ashish, you had your hand up. Yeah, I think as an entrepreneur, it's a good thing because, um, uh, first of all, I saw AngelList more as a blue ocean strategy. It wasn't really coming at the VCs. It was something that was, there were entrepreneurs out there who were not getting tapped into. So now uh, they could actually get some funds as well. <laughs> So I saw actually this as a good thing for VCs as well because they could now create some symbiotic relationships there. They could also tap into AngelList and uh, get get more syndicates created and get more funds. And plus, I think for an entrepreneur, it's a win because now he has a choice. So if he wants to uh, go and go to a VC, he can do that. If he wants to go the AngelList route, he can do that depending on his situation. Choice is good. I'm creating options. Interesting point you made. They're not coming after the VCs. You coming after the VCs? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, I'm serious. No, I agree with that. All right. We are not coming after the VCs. Travis, you haven't jumped in yet. No, I'll come back. I think instead of looking at this stratified, like do we say is it good or bad for VCs, good or bad for entrepreneurs, let's look at it from the, like the LinkedIn model. Is it good or bad for recruiters? Well, it's neither. The ones that use it and leverage it, it's really good for them. The ones that didn't, got steamrolled, but the really high-end or niche firms, it didn't matter because they've got resiliency to it. So Andreessen probably isn't, doesn't matter if he uses this or not, mm -hmm. uh, but people who are really good at leveraging information. So I've gotten tons of great info off of Angelus, but not paid a dime by exploring networks, see who knows whom, see who's connected to which companies, and that's where the value is. So if you get good at extracting that value, then, then it's good for you. And who's getting the best insight on that data of all? Because they know who you went to school with. They know who you worked with. They see all sorts of interesting data. Is this a good business or not? Nick? I think for entrepreneurs, sort of, when I think of like the things that, that VCs bring you, it's, it's usually capital, it's uh, like your first, like the key hires, mm -hmm. um, big, like big customers and business development deals, mm -hmm. and advice. And it seems like if you look at venture hacks, they're kind of hitting advice. If you look at recruiting at their talent platform, they're hitting recruiting. And they maybe haven't hit your first few sales customers, but who knows, right? And so, so I think there's, there's a lot of ways you can kind of um, do a patchwork of, of like a lot of things that VCs will otherwise give you. So they're actually doing it much less, with much less friction, and they take a lot less of your company. Not bad, guys. Let's talk about syndicates. Is this scalable? I mean, by April, $28 million in 72 syndicates? Oh. Do you want the update or not? That's <laughs> <laughs> for the debrief. All right. Before he made that comment, is this business scalable? Phil? Uh, I think that's, a, that's the question I've been asking my entire time, I think the entire day is that so basically for every 100 investments, like based on the current cost structure, and hopefully you're able to lower that a bit, but let's just say $10,000 in legal fees, it looked like 10.5 after the 65% reduction on the original 30%, or 30,000. So you go to 10.5, and then you look at, I don't know, let's say, say fully baked costs, let's add five grand to that number, I'm just going, okay. I don't know. So you have to, so for every 100 deals, you have to make one and a half million dollars <throat> on 5% uh, carry. Uh, that's a, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, provided, I mean, that's, again, that's, that's something that you have to keep in mind. Like, that's just not something you can guarantee yourself. And that's, that's the number one question in terms of scalability. If you can reduce the legal fees and the transaction costs, yeah, potentially. But again, 5% carry is not a lot. That means you've already paid your investors back, and then you're only taking the, the, the profit. 
over that. Are you voting yes or no? <laughs> I think uh, I think I'm just trying to frame the question for myself. Roger that. I'm asking you if you're voting yes or no. Is scalable. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. it's scalable. Yeah, it can be if they can uh, if they can reduce their transaction basically cost internally with the legal. You can reduce the transaction cost, then yes. Yeah, which is the definition of scalability. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else think it's a good idea or a bad idea? Can this business scale, Jonathan? Or sometimes I think that syndicates will have a increased position, but instead, uh, if they have a, a large core of the investors, then the investing activity itself will, will become as the uh, buying lottery. So I think the average profitability will approach the uh, average market profitability. So there should be a limitation. So in, be in essence, if syndicates works well, it should be the same returns as ventures as an asset class. I think so. Hmm. Ashish? I, I, I don't think it's a risk here because and if, if I had a choice, then I would go after the, uh, taking a VC and not a syndicate because um, you, so let's say that I'm the person who, behind whom people are investing the money and are counting on me. Mm -hmm. And But what if I, it's on my money, and so what if I do not take the same, um, uh, you know, detailed process into account when I'm going to invest that money? So right, but in theory, right, the syndicate leaders. If we've got the example of the Bitcoin gentleman, who's the Bitcoin expert, one could argue that person may know more than most VCs who might invest in Bitcoin. Carl Jacob, again, another example, was one of the early advisors of Facebook. This guy knows everything. Hugely successful entrepreneur. Aren't we just now making it such that you as an entrepreneur can get access to them and, and they can actually help raise money from all their rich buddies and men and women? And even everybody else who just signs up and says, that Carl Jacob person's got a pretty good deal flow. I'm going to let him manage my money. Yeah, from an entrepreneur standpoint, it's good. I think the people who are putting the money behind that person, so the, the investors in the syndicate, mm -hmm. I think it's more riskier for them because Yes, he did get successful, let's say, with Facebook, but will he continue to be as thoughtful with so much other people's money now when, compared to when he was investing his own money? Is there any guarantee that institutional investors will give you returns if they've been successful in the past? But I think the rigor that they will put, uh, if it's their own money, then I, I believe that that'll be much okay. higher compared to in a syndicate. Constantine? I think it would be really, uh, maybe it's really it's hard to scale because of the amount of inf information in the system. Because you have there's the, so many projects, so many investors, and just to connect them, mm -hmm. because the kind of number of matches is kind of going, you know. You got a data complexity issue potentially, Clement. That's Constantine's point. I think that's actually one of the reasons why syndicates do scale. There is so much information. There's so little common, common size metrics. That's why leadership through a lead investor is, is such a valuable thing. Well, no, I, I agree. It's scale in the sense that you're able to replicate a GPLP model with LDLA, which is not what they want to do right now. But then you, you may, at one point, if you have a LP and you don't have the protection of LP, you may have a, a problem at one point when you scale it. And I think I understand the first point, which is I'm get creating efficiencies in the business. I'm getting that one dollar that we start with here, I'm getting into the entrepreneur's hand more quickly and without the horrible management fee taken. But what was the second point? What, uh, what value does the LP have? The second point is, I mean, an LP, when you get into a fund, you get the level of protection. And here is basically following a, a lead in a syndicate, but it doesn't really get the same level of protection. So, I mean, it's a yes overall, but then. LPs might, in fact, be sophisticated with managing large pools of capital. They might be able to protect you better than perhaps an unsophisticated syndicate lead on AngelList. Okay. Final question for everybody before I turn it over, summarize, and then I'll turn it over to them. What do you all think of Maiden Lane? <laughs> think about this for a second. They're seeing what's coming through. Unbelievable data. They know who's interested in it. They know who the team is. They know where they went to school. They know who they worked for in the past. Now they're going to raise a fund and cherry pick where they want to deploy capital. 
What did you all think of that? Are they going to take all the good deals for themselves? Or does it become a signal that if they invest, that's where you want to put your money? Is Maiden Lane a good thing or a bad thing for AngelList? Phil. I have a question with regard to uh, how the GPLP uh, flow through works. I, I kind of was trying to diagram this out for myself uh, with Maiden Lane and then how the returns would be distributed. So basically Maiden Lane sits and will invest in AngelList syndicates and they have within Maiden Lane obviously a GPLP split, you mm -hmm. know, 80-20 perhaps. Uh, but syndicates also have a kind of a yeah. GPLP split as well. Right. And I'm just trying to like, I was trying to, I think, uh, visualize or at least figure out that, that split and how Maiden Lane uh, distributes then to their LPs. Are they distributing like the portion that they the, their carry in the right. other carry? We'll ask them in the debrief okay. to talk about the mechanics of it. Yeah. But I want to get back to this question of whether or not does this create signaling in the market? Are they now market makers? Ralph? I believe so. I mean, this is a little bit like when we talked to my capital group and they wrote to us. It was actually a big concern of their customers to keep that data completely separate and not do their own internal deals. And they actually standardized on saying we will not ever do internal deals ourselves because if we were to utilize the data that our customers provide us by making their deals then they would no longer trust us with that information mm -hmm. so it's definitely a conflict of interest that you, ask you think it's a conflict of interest all right mark i mean every investment bank does this um, when they're raising capital um, they put their own you know private clients into the deals that they're underwriting but so I, I kind of see some similarities there. But I just think it was a smart strategic move for them to put their money where their mouth is to say syndicates can work and also to kind of kickstart the deal flow. So I mean, of the 28 million in syndicates back then, 25 of it came from Maiden Lane. I'm sure it's much more now in part thanks mm -hmm. to Maiden Lane getting that started. Okay. Eric? Yeah, I think that um, it's definitely a signal, but I've yet to see that the data information they have results in successful investments. So I think that it's not necessarily conflict of interest. Okay, David, you had your hand up or is it moved on? No, uh, uh, I think they're buying one side of the marketplace, which mm -hmm. is important, a two-sided marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly, like, like you said. And the uh, second part, as long as they don't fill up the round, I think it's a signal. Mm -hmm. If they go in and they completely close a deal, then uh, it's, it's conflict. But if they go and leave 50% or whatever it is of the deal open to the platform, then it's great. For now? So apart from the overlap in the management and, and the invest, investor relationship, as long as the data that they have is available to everybody else, the data that Maiden Lane gets is available to everybody else, it's still a level playing field in my opinion. What if they see it first? Then, then there's a conflict. Yes. Okay, any other thoughts on Maiden Lane? Travis? It's interesting because it's not just another revenue source, but it, it, potential, it, it could really amplify what they're doing. And it's good. So if they say, look, the syndicate model does work, and everybody else should do this, it's great. But if AngelList is using their syndicate model and they fail and it doesn't work, then why would anybody else do it? Because it's the best info of anybody. And so if it doesn't work, that's a big problem. Yeah, potentially, if they choose poorly, that could also be a signal, which would actually hurt potentially the core business. Interesting point. OK. Sergey? Uh, actually, I didn't understand why they, they did it. Because if Naval, Naval is on the board of this, uh, the, uh, on this venture fund, uh, why wouldn't he become the lead for, for syndicates? Mm -hmm. And those all LPs of this fund would just follow him on the angel list, and that's it. So it's a little bit artificial, I think. And uh, yeah, it doesn't show a lot of, uh, it's not a signal for me. Okay. Of this All right, we'll ask the two of them to address that in the closed session. I want to actually give them the chance to talk. Let's up level this is because if we look at the context of the last four and a half weeks, where does this fit in? Early stage financing is going through tremendous changes. And if you look at what Angelus is making happen, the I would argue some of the dynamics of what's happening in the larger funds and in the smaller funds is absolutely positively being driven by activities by what they're doing. The experiment's still being run. We're still figuring it out as to how big this is going to do and what kind of dent this may or may not put in the universe. As an early stage venture capitalist, I find it hugely interesting. We've actually been able to get a, fair, a lot of data from what's going on, and it's been hugely helpful for our portfolio companies. 
And truth be told, I think a lot of the attitudes that we hear from them are actually very fair. If we don't deliver returns and we don't deliver deal flow, we shouldn't be in the business. So why should I as a venture capitalist be afraid of this? If I'm good at my job, I get to keep it. If I'm not good at my job, I lose it. This is just another source of capital coming in and I have to prove to entrepreneurs that I can add value. So a lot of the points you raised about will syndicates be able to help you with hiring? Will they be able to help you with recruiting and opening doors? These are the types of things where a venture capitalist, if he or she is good at what he or she does, should be trying to differentiate versus syndicates. You might get an access to a Carl Jacob. Hopefully, as a venture capital firm, I can present a whole team to an entrepreneur. Then the entrepreneur has to decide whether or not dealing with the overhead of a slimy, scum-sucking VC is worth it. What I will say is this. When you hear them tell the story about how they see that what the world could be like later, it's a big swing. So if we look at this at two different levels, as entrepreneurs trying to do something really different and upset the apple cart, they're really trying to upset the apple cart. Billions and billions of dollars, and they're trying to turn it all on its head. And for you as entrepreneurs, absolutely positively, I'd encourage you to spend a lot of time looking at AngelList because there are a lot of interesting things that will, it will enable you to do that you couldn't do five years ago. So with that, please join me in welcoming our guests and let them uh, comment on the case. So, you covered about uh, eight hours worth of topics in about an hour. <laughs> so I tried to take some notes about uh, some of the topics you covered and have some observations, and uh, Ash will have some observations as well. Um, and it was very interesting, first of all, thank you for the invitation and thank you for letting us uh, listen to you discuss this because it was interesting hearing what the perception is of AngelList, and some of it's dead on, and some of it we're like, oh, we took notes, we gotta, we gotta start addressing that one in the marketplace. Um, but I, I'll make a few comments. Um, most of my comments at this point, I think will uh, actually dive down into some of the details of what you said, uh, things that we don't normally go into in the press or uh, in the public media, um, so that you can understand what was going on behind the scenes in our thinking when we were going through the same kinds of thinking that you were going through in the case. Um, so to take it from the top, the first issue that you guys addressed, and I'll summarize it, is, is AngelList a business or a charity? <laughs> so uh, I, I will say, uh, at the high level, that's one that we ourselves, we believe it's a business. It is unresolved in our own minds. We believe it's a business, we believe it's a big business. But when we started it, we absolutely started it to upend the apple cart without the idea that we were going to turn it into a business. Uh, that came along later as the thing started to really take off and we started to attach a business model to it. So from that perspective, we are absolutely more along the lines of, uh, uh, think Google or Facebook. I'm not saying we'll necessarily be that successful. I hope we are. Um, but that we started with a mission, we're not extracting value for that key mission. Facebook's not extracting value for making the connections, nor is Google extracting value from you for every search, but can we find a business model that goes alongside of it that helps us further that mission? We are very much in that mold, and we're still working through that ourselves. Like I say, we're here because we bet on it as a business, we believe it, uh, we put our careers into it, but um, that, for the data is yet to be resolved. Um, do you have anything more to add yeah, on that one? Yeah, it links That's... into the comment about Craigslist, as in like uh, becoming something like Craigslist is a bad thing. Uh, we think becoming something like Craigslist is a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, you provide a lot of value and you create a network and have critical mass behind that network. And then you monetize certain verticals, the most valuable verticals. So Craigslist monetizes uh, recruiting in real estate and for us, Fundraising is obviously the most lucrative of those, which is why half the team works on it. Um, and the other half works on stuff that probably will never make money, but it builds the, the core network. Yep. Um, so the next one uh, that I wanted to touch on, which was interesting, was uh, this idea of, uh, and, and I'll call it broadly, uh, crowdfunding or sophisticated access. Uh, because this one uh, we talked through internally quite a bit, especially while the Jobs Act was being passed because everybody kept associating us with the crowdfunding aspect, but that actually had nothing to do with what we were doing on Capitol Hill. There was another section called the 201C platform section that we were focused on. Um, and we are very much uh, would 
agree that at the early stage, the idea of kind of taking a Kickstarter model to early stage capital, um, there's so much more than picking whether you like the product or not that I think it would be a bad idea. And maybe ultimately it would be a good idea. Let me put it this way. There would be a long time when a lot of people would lose money making bad choices along the way before you got there and people kind of figured out what was going on. So uh, that was part of the idea behind syndicates to make sure that all the money going in was going in behind sophisticated investors who already knew what they were doing, who vetted the terms, who vetted the company, et cetera. So you get it down to, yes, I would like to support that company, but the company has already been pre-screened by an investor who makes, uh, has a good track record along the way. So a lot of what, uh, when you get especially to the individual investors who come on, they actually go into something we didn't even discuss today, um, which is the platform funds, uh, where we have funds mm -hmm kind of like Maiden Lane, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, that gets into the platform, uh, that, that then gets spread by us across deals for them. Uh, so think more like what Vanguard does for public market investing, we would do for private market investing. That's where we, we put those guys. Then we have the sophisticated guys. Um, those guys will never charge. That's the, uh, to somebody's point earlier. Sophisticated investors meeting good companies is not something we want to make money off of. That's, uh, that will always be a service of the platform. Yeah. Should I do updates or is that going to compromise the discussion? Because there are three big variables uh, that have changed, or sorry, one number that's changed and then some variables that have changed. Uh, one is those numbers up there have tripled since April. Um, so that's an update. Another update is uh, we now charge the cost back to the investors. So that 10K of legal fees that we were covering for a while, that's now charged back to the investors and we received almost no backlash at all on that. And the third is what Kevin was just saying about platform funds. So earlier this year, we launched um, what, what I called the syndicates fund, which is just an index. You click one button, it had a 50K minimum, so it was very high, but you got into about 200 deals on AngelList. And that, those funds that we're running, we don't charge any fees on them and they don't get any special access but they're managed by AngelList in such a way that they automatically and semi-automatically and systematically invest in a very broad range of deals. The reason we did it, lots of reasons we did it, but basically for, for that. There are a certain class of investors on AngelList and that are not yet on AngelList but would be enticed by this sort of product that don't want to close a deal a week, that do want diversification, that can't get access. And if we don't capture them in those funds, they're just not going to invest on AngelList at all. So we did that also it's a good uh, shield for us and for the companies and the leads on the platform because that's a, it's sort of a liability shield. We can put less sophisticated investors in there. We can make more disclosures. They're more diversified. They're less likely to lose all their money, all that sort of stuff. Um, so there are a couple of updates and I think yeah, this, that's, uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, this is zero right now. Yeah, to yeah exactly. Somebody's earlier point that, for that exact reason. Yeah. So we, we have zero incremental out of pocket for every mm. fund that closes. Mm. It's all upside on the carry. Yeah. We're charging it back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're charging it back. Charging investors. it back at cost. So there are a few little updates. Uh, two, two fairly abstract points, which just might sort of change the discussion a little bit. Um, and it might be hard to get these across quickly. But I'd like to encourage you to think of two things. Uh, one is the network effects on AngelList and, and what investing is. So especially early stage private investing, uh, you get a lot of your information from other people from what other people are doing, right? Like you can't really be a fundamentals investor at the early stage because there aren't many fundamentals of the company. They're not really making any money. You can't sort of take a Warren Buffett-like approach to investing in startups. But what you can do is look at what other smart people are doing and like interpolate from that. And so, you know, if, if you do a lot of networking as part of being an early stage investor, where does networking happen best? Where does it happen at most scale? On the internet, um, where all these nodes are doing all these different things. And, so I just encourage you to think of it from like a, a network's perspective. Uh, I'd also encourage you to think of it uh, from a market microstructure perspective, as in just try and draw as many analogies as you can between what happens on public markets and what could happen on private markets. And that starts to, that will help you think about all the things we could perhaps do next and what we try to do with like forcing disclosure by companies, with standardizing the structure of the vehicles, uh, with setting transaction costs as a fixed fee per deal. All those sorts of things. So anyway, thinking about it from those two perspectives, the first will help you understand sort of why we're trying to build a platform and get 
do lots of things for free just to get a lot of information on AngelList so investors can make good decisions um, and get that networking happening online. And the second will help you understand sort of what sort of businesses we can create um, and then how we view ourselves as, as in terms of our obligation to the people that use the platform. Um, and there was a, an interesting topic about uh, good or bad for VC, which you mentioned oh, yeah. a couple times. Um, we actually aren't out to destroy VCs. That wasn't what we set out to do. We definitely set out to equalize information, as somebody mentioned earlier. Um, we also set about trying to reduce the transaction costs where they could be reduced. Uh, VCs have this weird structure where the costs are basically fixed. Uh, and as other things have gotten expensive and cheaper, more money's just gone into the VC's pocket or not. Um, which has, especially as things have gotten much, much cheaper now, uh, has seemed a little weird to us. So uh, that's why we try to reduce those transaction costs as much as possible. Uh, interestingly, uh, most VCs in liquid markets, so call it New York, Silicon Valley, uh, London, the uh, consider us very much the way Robert presented, which is, okay, we're part of the ecosystem. Um, they've got to justify it. There are always, they always had six competitors sitting next to them. That was the way it worked. And by the way, those competitors were also their collaborators. That's also just the way it works. AngelList is no different in those markets. Where it really has hit, and in hindsight, we should have thought of this, um, but we didn't when we were rolling out, is where the VCs, I mean, if you think about what we've done, we've lowered the barrier of entry to VC. Who gets hurt the most by that? The VCs, where they had power because they were the only entrant. So if you take one of these regional VCs, they hate us. Those are the ones that hate us. Somebody who was the only VC in, you know, I, I'm trying to not uh, name one where people can figure out who the VC is, but in their uh, geography where like they were the big dog and there might have only been three players, but they were 80% of the market. Those are the guys that you will actually, those are the only VCs that will speak out against us publicly in the press. Um, those are the guys you'll find there. And that's been a very interesting thing to us. But that is, by the way, where we think we have helped the entrepreneurs the most. That's where adding efficiency has made a big difference. Um, yeah, from the VC's perspective there, I mean, think about what we do uh, with syndicates, right? We do all the boring back office work. Um, we give you exposure as someone leading deals who could otherwise maybe go and raise your own fund. We give you exposure to a bunch of investors, about 40,000 accredited, that can put money into your deals. So, so they're effectively LPs. And all you have to do is just focus on getting good deals and doing good diligence. So you're not doing the really painful things about being a VC, which is dealing with accountants, lawyers, and LPs. We like abstract that away for you, mm -hmm. and then you just focus on the deals and you know, helping the entrepreneur build their company. I would say as a VC also, I get the benefit of syndicates. You know, mm -hmm. All of my friends up there will send me their deals to look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a source of deal flow for me. Yeah. Yeah, and it's part of the, the ecosystem. I mean, that's just, just the evol evolving of the ecosystem, yeah. as you were talking about earlier. Um, we touched on the transaction costs, so before I dive into some of the finance stuff, um, I, I, I should stop and you guys may have some questions about what's happened since, and then I'll touch on some of the actual finance that's going on underneath. Uh, there were some topics related the to that, and then made in lane. So. Yeah. 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 So this, is, this come up earlier, I'd like to get your views on what, what, do you, what do you think is the threat of people tapping on your network? Uh, on the data, but then going offline to compete with deals. Oh, we're out. So we were, uh, I mean, that part of it, since we generally don't make money off of sophisticated investors meeting savvy companies, would be the equivalent of you asking me, what do you think as Facebook about somebody who sees that somebody's single on Facebook and not messaging them through the platform? Have at it. That's, <laughs> that we're, we think that's a wonderful thing. It meets our mission but it doesn't really tie into where we believe that we would make money. We believe that the people who could do that would have options anyway. We're a good information source, but those guys we were never going to charge or you know, put it this way. Uh, we couldn't intermediate a transaction that was formerly direct. That doesn't make sense. So for us, um, the more interesting places where we can charge are A, where it wouldn't have happened anyway, and B, where one of the parties values that access so much that they, they 
feel right paying about it. Now, in economic terms, there's way to put, ways to put that that don't come to feelings. But um, so in the case of talent, uh, you have this bilateral thing. We did do some experiments. Uh, companies were willing to pay, but some of them didn't feel right. We have pulled that back and we're thinking about how to do that now so that we can make companies value it. Um, although, ironically, the tracking in talent is easier because you have two sides that can report and you just reward one of the sides and you're, you're done. So it's not a huge issue, but uh, uh, we want the value to be there, the perceived value to be there. Um, in the uh, syndicate stuff, that just hasn't been an issue. We have absolutely have people try to go around the syndicate direct to the company, but if any of you here fundraise and somebody comes up to you and they're uh, you've never heard of them and they say, I'd like to put 3,000 into your company, what do you do? If you're about to put 50,000 in the company or 100,000 in the company, now you're back to the case where they could have contacted you anyway. We're not worried about that. So we're only interested in charging in that case where there was value and where we're giving you access we wouldn't otherwise have done. So it, it, it does come up a lot. I mean, we, I, I do want to know the data, but I want to know the data because I'm missing the data, not because I think we can monetize. I'm not worried about that at all. Yeah, it's important to distinguish between deal flow and access, right? It's like mm -hmm. one thing to see a lot of deals and maybe compare your investments you're thinking about with other ones that you're seeing, whatever else. It's another thing to actually have access to the entrepreneur and for them to want to take your money, to want to deal with you for a long time. And where, you know, where we fit in is where an investor can see a lot of deal flow and see good stuff, but they won't have access. So we'll bundle them into a group of other investors that also don't have access behind someone that does have access, a lead. Give the lead the incentive to bring the deal to AngelList in the first place, which is they can get carry because we create an entity for them to do that. And then we put them all in. And then the from the entrepreneur's perspective, it's like, well, it's one entity and one on my cap table and one check. I don't really, I don't really care if all those people are in it. By the way, if that sounds familiar, that's because that's the venture model. <laughs> that's yeah. Every step of that is what venture capitalists do. They bundle up people who didn't have otherwise have access behind yeah. somebody who knows and does work. We've just disaggregated it so that it's yeah, all these syndicates are. The they're pieces, just mini right. VC funds. Every exactly. little deal is like a little VC fund. That's the right way to think about it. Yep. Let's start. If, uh, oh. yeah. It's okay. We'll come back to you in a minute, Matt. So, God, I wonder if you. Um, if you uh, uh, if you track your results, I mean the uh, the investment results of your backers from mm -hmm. your system from the very beginning, mm -hmm. because whether they positive or negative, people will asso investors who yep. invest through AngelList will associate those results with the platform, right? Yeah. yeah. So 100%. do you track those results and what YC, are the results? YC gets full credit for Dropbox and Airbnb, whether they deserve any or not. And who knows whether they do, and we'll get, we'll get the same thing. We'll also get the blame if it doesn't come through, whether we deserve it or not. Uh, that's the way they'll associate. So uh, I will answer it three ways. Way number one is, of course, we're tracking. Way number two is, in seed, um, it's going to be eight years before we know. So we've only had this platform out there for three, so we've got another five before we even have any statistically relevant data. So it's going to be a long time before that matters. Um, the answer three is, right now, all our statistics are screwed up. And they're screwed up for a very good reason. Uber flowed through the platform. Shervin Pishavar invested at six million pre-money. That's a 2,000x return. Nothing else matters, <laughs> right? Uh, Naval invested through the platform into Uber. That's a 2,000x return. Nothing else matters. So if we present stats right now, it's not in IRRs, it's in like 50x returns, right? It just looks stupid. Now, that said, to be intellectually honest, we don't. When we're talking to institutional LPs on Maiden Lane, we actually subtract Uber and then say, here's what it would look like without it. Because it, it's, it's, that's the crazy hit. That said, the, that's Silicon Valley. If you subtract the crazy hits from Silicon Valley, we have negative returns. So it's really hard. I mean, this is why it's so hard to go about as an LP figuring out which fund to do. You know, now, OK, you subtract Google, Facebook, Twitter, and the, you know, a couple other billion dollar ones. That's the top 0.01% of companies. And now all the returns are negative. But include those, and the returns are fantastic. So what do you do with those? So anyway, we look a lot like Silicon Valley right now, uh, for better or for worse. Right now. You know, it'd be great if we could run around taking credit for Uber. We're a little careful about that with the LPs, and we don't actually, other than putting them on the platform, really run around and say, yeah, Uber was here. 
but that's kind of the, the current mm -hmm. state of tracking backer returns on the platform. By the way, if uh, you have an investor account, and I think even if you don't, you can see most of this data. If you go to angel.co slash invest, you can see all the syndicate deals and you can see if they've done an up round or if they've been acquired. Now, syndicates itself has been around, been publicly around for about a year and then we were running it in private for about a year before that. So it hasn't been around very long, but you'll see there are already a dozen up rounds and a few exits as well. Um, yeah. But if you want to dig into the detail, it's there. It's public. Yeah, and this will be for better or for worse transparent the whole way through. That's, uh, yeah. Oh, we're going to get a mat next. <laughs> yeah. That was more or less the Russian version of my question. <laughs> <laughs> the corollary to go back to something Professor Siegel said earlier was, um, you know, seed investing is very lucrative when you can follow on and when you can continue right. through the capital stack. And yes. I would argue that, you know, people that are writing ten thousand dollar checks on AngelList probably aren't going to keep pace in a twenty million dollar B round. Um, so, so, so we, we don't, don't know. know. I mean, yes. it's for, um, I will say, uh, having been around the block a few times before doing this, uh, I mean, most of us were investors prior to AngelList, that pro rata rights are a part of the syndicate deals. It's a standard side letter that the company signs. Yeah. Um, we don't know what individual investors will do, and we encourage them to plan for it uh, when they're setting up their stuff. We certainly do in the funds. So Maiden Lane has reserves. All of these have reserves so that they can follow along in those. Yeah, and we essentially, practically what happens when a pro rata opportunity comes up, we just re-syndicate it. So we send it out to the same people and say, do you want it? If they don't want it, we might mop it up with some other fund or whatever. Yeah. But we build it in to every deal. Sorry. Yeah. So, so the case indicates that uh, there has been a metamorphosis to the uh, And the case also mentions that one of the key drivers has been the, the lack of sophistication between two two ends of the spectrum which presented you with the opportunity. Mm -hmm. But there are other areas as well. For example, advisory services for uh, the entrepreneurs. So are you contemplating that because part of that growth discussion, the scalability mm -hmm. discussion, are you contemplating increasing the bouquet uh, as part of the scaling yes. strategy? I can say that Ash and I were discussing ways to do that on the way down. Uh, we're trying to figure that out. Um, I can say the thing that prevents us from going faster, because if we were a services model, so think of what Andreessen Horowitz did when they came into venture. They started stacking up these services like recruiting, like initial biz dev and things like that, that they could hire and provide to their companies. Um, we don't do it until we can turn it into a scalable platform of some sort. Um, but as we can figure those out, we'll, we're certainly interested in expanding what we can do for the company to the point that somebody else made earlier about uh, being able to focus on product. Like that was the, the big deal, that you can go down, focus on product, do as good a job as you can there, and you either succeed or fail. But the things that used to take 80% of the time in the early days um, shouldn't take that long. And that's, if you think about that as a model, that is kind of how we think about what we can do next to help the entrepreneurs. Sure. Okay. With, with so many metrics to focus on, when you look at like the, the fundraising piece or the talent piece, what are sort of the most important metrics that the company cares about? Yeah, dollars. Yeah. So for fundraising, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean everything. Capitalism flows up. is nicely Every, focused. Everything right? flows up to that, right? As in, like we're building marketplaces for all these verticals. Um, so for talent, it's if someone, if a candidate is interested in a company and the company is also interested in the candidate, they get matched and maybe that leads to a hire and whatever. So we're not fully closing the loop there, um, but in as much as we do close the loop, we know that there has been some quality asset that we've had and we've matched to something else. And more practically, uh, well, sorry, more um, presently with the fundraising thing, we know that if an investor has put a dollar behind a deal, they think the deal's good. So we, we do try and track things, like we have some pretty interesting ways to track the quality of deals on, on AngelList. We have interesting ways to track like how much each backer spends and when they spend it and you know, do the leads change the incentives in the over, over deals. We have all sorts of things we track, but it all comes back down to dollars. And also that's how we get paid. Like we get paid carry on the dollars that come through AngelList. And as long as the syndicate's product gets like to be a better and better way of, uh, of fund, fundraising for your company, those dollars will go up. I mean, that's an interesting question to put to the class. Like, it was sort of 
put to the class in a different way, but you know, why would you raise from a syndicate as, uh, rather than a seed fund? You know, if, let's pick any, any fund, I don't know, a meddling fund, Excel, um, <laughs> I wanted to put a million bucks into your company, or if Gil Pinchina or Tim Ferriss wanted to raise a million bucks to their syndicate, like why would you go with one or the other? Um, we often, I mean, that's, that's often the, the conflict that good entrepreneurs have. Um, and I don't know, maybe someone wants to think about that. And I've got, I've got one or two answers if we don't get to one. You talk a bit about stats. Um, I was wondering if you've analyzed like the very low level stats, like how people are interacting with the site, like the micro actions they have. Um, you obviously have a lot of logs on that stuff. And you, know, you can integrate that with a bunch of like LinkedIn APIs to see like, you know, how people are connected to each other. We quite regularly do this. Um, so about every three months, uh, an engineer named Milos and I go dig into the data, do whatever regressions we can to find good correlations that are worth digging into, and then we dig further into those. Um, very interestingly, uh, there's, uh, uh, I can go a step beyond what we did. So one of the things we did with uh, Professor Bernstein here um, we just put a, a paper out um, based on some work we did with even A-B testing with investors, uh, what they react to, and since we know the sophistication of the investor, we can even track that. Um, I can tell you the most interesting things are that we are basically able to quantify what most of venture would call the conventional wisdom. We're not upending it. You know, the, the VCs weren't, weren't wrong when they said team, 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 or whatever. But we can actually say, here's how much they actually act as if that's true. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the upshot of that is what investors look for, and the more experienced, the more likely they are, are team, traction, and social proof in that order. So, and the more experienced the investor, the more likely they are to wait team exclusively, um, and then you, you, know, you get a little less experience, team traction, you get less than that, team traction, social proof. So uh, we, we have some actual numbers that are in the paper that are interesting. But outside of that, it's, it's, we haven't yet discovered kind of the money ball for uh, yeah. uh, venture where we can say, aha, there's the undiscovered gem that everybody should jump on. It's either uh, completely chaotic or there aren't a lot of huge undiscovered inefficiencies the way there might be in some other industries. Alex. Uh, how has being, being like a mission-oriented company been helpful as you like, think back versus like if you were just a traditional company? And how has that really evolved for you going yeah. from starting a blog to now us drilling you on how you're going to make a bunch of money off of it? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And I, it, it's... The, uh, I can say uh, it would be a little different if we all hadn't been in venture and had previous successful exits because uh, then we'd be saying, well, what do we do with this thing? We were all thinking in terms of once it started to take off, oh, okay, if we attach a business model, then it'll grow like crazy. Like that's, it was a more natural thought for us. That said, uh, the mission-based part of it, there's no question it makes a big difference in a company. In terms of recruiting, it's far easier to recruit because you're passionate about something. If you find other people are passionate about it, they want to jump on it. Um, if things go a little sideways one month on the, the financials, if you're mission-based, that is a hitch to solve. It's not like, oh, forget it, I'm out of here, this isn't going to work. There's a whole bunch of characteristics of a mission-based company that I think are uh, better to manage on the rational side and on the irrational side, a heck of a lot more fun to work in. Like, I, I don't think I would work anywhere else. That's, how, that's my favorite kind of company, just because I can get much more passionate about what I do. I can say, from an investor perspective, it's an interesting incentive that I think the investors tend to look for, as opposed to avoid, even though it seems like, well, if you're not purely financial, because there are all these opportunities to exit early along the way that the mission-based guys, you know, think Mark Zuckerberg getting the offer or Larry and Sergey getting the offer, and they're like, forget it, I have something to do, even though it's stupid to turn down a billion dollars at this point. I, I think that was the offer from Google for Facebook. Of course, it turned out to be the right thing uh, in hindsight, but for the investors who are betting on it being the, the multi-billion dollar exit, 
um, you want somebody who has a reason to push past a lot of those distractions. So I, I, I have nothing but good things to say about that model for venture finance companies. Yeah, and then, you know, why didn't AngelList exist? <laughs> so why didn't AngelList exist before AngelList? Uh, it's because no one had built critical mass in a niche of very high quality investors and founders. And this thing started not making any money. It started with Nivian Naval's personal networks. It started totally free service, mailing list. And they built this excellent group of about, you know, a thousand investors. And then before we turned, they turned the spigot in January 2013, when one day I decided like 15,000 investors in the queue in, in your come. But before that point, it was like a thousand really high quality investors and, you know, a few thousand startups. And we built this like little flywheel and like trust and a brand, like a really good brand um, where people entrusted us with all this information about their companies and whatever else. And I think it's only because of that, only because it had that mission from the start that people bought into it, that people used it intensely and that formed the basis of the marketplace. And I mean, I think this is a very important thing to, uh, to factor in whenever you're thinking about a new company is how do you make like a thousand people incredibly happy rather than a million people sort of happy uh, because they just won't care about your product. And that's what the mission helped us do really early on. Mm -hmm. So before I go further, uh, let me do a quick time check because I do want to cover five o'clock. Okay, so let's do a few more questions then I'll cover some of the uh, finance stuff in Maiden Lane. So, Ryan? Um, so to that end about it not existing before and existing now, another potential explanation that we touched on is that this is a unique time for Silicon Valley and lots mm -hmm. of small investors are more interested in mm -hmm. investing in this space than maybe in you know, normal times or whatever that is. I'm wondering, I'm wondering, um, yeah. How much you think about the trendiness of it? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think there's very much a secular trend towards a world made up of many smaller companies. Um, a lot of the advantages that big companies had in the past, like building massive supply chains, reaching customers through advertising, um, you know, scaling uh, infrastructure, those advantages are available to smaller companies now. You can, you know, distribute your, you can do shipping through an API, you can use Amazon's infrastructure, and you can put ads on Google. And so, the, uh, you know, I think there's generally a trend towards like a lot of big monoliths being broken up into many smaller companies. And we absolutely benefit from, from that trend. And if you believe in that trend, then, you know, th there will be more smaller companies getting funded. And that's yeah. actually not a bad thing. I, I want to separate the two pieces because, by the way, I absolutely agree in what you say. You know, suddenly my neighbor is asking me about how he can put money in startups and he's a doctor. Mm. Like, it's not natural. And so far, I've ducked his questions. But the... Uh, <laughs> um, what Ash is saying is right. So if just to uh, one of the perceptions I heard earlier uh, about the AngelList investor base. So we've done uh, analyses. Actually, it was part of that paper. We did some analyses of the investor base. So over 60% of the active investors on AngelList have been successful founders themselves. Um, another 20% are financial professionals uh, in the business have had past experience investing. So then there's another 20% mostly made up of people in the finance business outside of Silicon Valley. And then there's a few odds and ends. So I'd guess probably 7% or so that are probably what you were thinking when you think random people throwing money into the companies. Most of these are the people that you would think are value add investors. So Gil, for example, is making a big deal out of this when he does his syndicate. He's like, by the way, you don't just get me. Uh, he's using it to solve the problem that you had of, well, look, here's my team. He's like, here's my team. These are my backers. If we need to get into that company, the VP of biz dev in that company is one of the backers in your company. I'll call him up. So he's using that to start to present. So that's kind of the, the current set of investors. Now, there's a bunch of people knocking at our door that we are trying to figure out with what to do with, and that was part of the impetus be behind creating these platform funds. Um, and that group, I don't know. They, I would expect they will disappear as soon as you, you know, you'll have this cycle. They'll go away. I don't think the founders funding founders will go away. They're in it for a different reason. Yeah, and also uh, we're seeing the mix on AngelList uh, switch from being like 100% individuals and accredited to being more institutions. Right. Um, so Maiden Lane is a fund that has a bunch of institutions in it, and that forms a significant, well, makes up a significant proportion of capital committed on AngelList. And you saw this with Lending Club as well, right? Lending Club started very much P2P. You know, more than 50% of the capital in Lending Club now comes from big institutions. So 
we're sort of we're providing ways and building tools to let these institutions manage their investments more effectively, which means the capital is flowing through us more, and that's more stable capital. Um, so, so we'll manage that risk. So let's go over here since we haven't been there. Rudolf. Yeah. No, I was just wondering actually from the staff point of view, I and mean, since uh, Maybelline and Angela are sister companies, are there any bridges between the two? And did you see any oh, yeah. from the staff who wanted to go to the other? Let, let me dive into Maiden Lane since we're getting the questions yeah. here. So uh, it, there was a very good discussion around Maiden Lane and the right points. I can tell you, uh, I, don't, I forget exactly uh, what pieces of this were in the case and what weren't. Um, we had this beautiful idea that we had this whole structure with the syndicates and everything else, and then if people had large pools of money and they wanted to diversify into seed, they should just put it on syndicates and they would just follow a bunch of people and automatically go into every deal that Gil did and Eli Gill and the guys on AngelList. But the LPs didn't want to do that, so when we'd go talk to them, they would say things like, great, so where are your financial controls? Where's the audit? Where do you assign values to the companies? Um, the uh, who is it since, uh, and, and I'm going to say this negatively, but it's not. I'll come back to that in a minute. I'm not going to do any work for this money. <laughs> like My whole point of putting it over there is that you do the work. I'm going to go home and go to sleep. I'm, that's what, you know, if you have a lot of money, why would you want to spend all your time counting it? You want to be on a yacht. So the, uh, uh, all of those things uh, led us, so everybody said, interesting, come back to me when you have a more traditional looking vehicle. So the reason that Maiden Lane exists in the funny form that it does, it's actually just a syndicate fund. It's actually managed yeah. exactly the same way the syndicate fund is, with some exceptions that are inserted only because the LPs insisted that they be there. So that's why the weird structure. So the structure is, it's an LP, it's a way for traditional institutional investors to put money onto AngelList. And so we have a venture fund, Atlas, who's one of AngelList's investors, who's contributed their back office to do the audit and the financial controls. And uh, we're working through automation of some of the, the valuation issues and et cetera. And if we get all that right, then it will be built into the platform. So if we do our job right, there probably will be something equivalent of a maiden lane two, we won't call it that, some other large institutional fund that will exist. Hopefully there won't be a maiden lane three, like we can get all those things built into the platform so that the institutions can do it. Until we can do that, we face all these signaling issues that come from having this fund hanging out there that's like this sister fund or whatever. But it's really intended to be exactly like syndicates fund and they're actually managed that way. And we've put a lot of work into, um, like the, the, uh, somebody was asking the carry questions. So the way Maiden Lane works, because that was too complicated for the LPs, not that they're stupid, they just wanted it to fit into their existing spreadsheets, um, was there is a, it's a zero, zero expense ratio, 30 carry fund, but the, the, you know, it's the don't worry about what happens behind the curtain. That 30 carry is intended to cover all that complexity. That carry pays all this underlying carry, so they don't need to worry about any of that. It's a straight 30 carry fund as far as they're concerned. 30 carry was set to approximate with a little bit of buffer about what the deal by deal carry would come out to so that we can do the math. So that's, it, it even got reported on wrong that way. People didn't understand, the press doesn't get the deal by deal versus net and all that. Can I, can I ask you a follow-up yep. question? When you guys, as AngelList takes, uh, sorry, when, you, when, yep. when AngelList takes in carry, right? That five percent. Yeah. Where does that go to you and your employees, or to the shareholders? Or uh, there's a bucket of it that we set aside and split among the employees, uh, and then the remainder is right now. I mean, there's the, when the exits come in, they would sit at AngelList. AngelList is an LLC, so theoretically the taxes would flow back, and we would make distributions at some point. Um, we haven't figured that out yet. Like, uh, is it going to be uh, a bunch of financial positions, in which case it doesn't look like a traditional company? Yeah. Or do we uh, kind of make this the engine and then make then Angelus right. becomes? You have like three entities, right? That they sort of. Oh, well, sorry. Yeah, that's all for regulatory purposes. For financial purposes, think of it as there's carry that goes to Angelus. Um, right. Just be. I'm just thinking about yeah. if I were an employee of Angelus, like how you know how you look at kind it's of. Sort of like working at a tech company. Sort of like working at a venture fund. That's yes, what I'm saying. Exactly. It's got to be some it's hybrid approach. You get a to that. salary yeah. and you get like free meals, and then you also get a bit of carry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it really is a weird hybrid of a job. Yeah. Yeah. So we have time for about one or two more questions. 
Okay. Mark? So from the entrepreneur's perspective, I could see tons of positives to raising in such a public way, but I also would have some concerns. In terms of the negative signaling, you couldn't raise on Sandhill, or even you've been up on AngelList, but have gotten no traction. Yep. So you have a bunch of future entrepreneurs in this room. Um, how would you mitigate those concerns to us? Yeah, so they aren't concerns. Um, <laughs> done. No, um, the, there's two reasons. Uh, so one of them that I think people mistake, and it's kind of our fault, and this, we discuss this internally branding-wise, is going on AngelList doesn't mean you're raising publicly. That yeah. is just one of the options. Some companies turn it on, especially uh, companies that are, you know, if you have Tim Ferriss investing, of course you'll want to do that, and it's not a negative signal. Um, the... Uh, or especially if you're using it to partially generate press and partially generate funding. Um, but most companies, we even turned off, for example, five, what they call 506C, that non-accredited investors can see your financing on the platform. You have to contact us and tell us you're doing it before we'll even allow it. The, uh, uh, even then, you can choose to do even a completely private financing. So I'm going to do Gil and his syndicate, and the rest of the world will not see it. So you, as the entrepreneur, get to decide the level of visibility. AngelList is just the platform, and you will support anything you want to do as the entrepreneur. Kind of like the deal room, virtual deal room. Yeah, yeah we kind can, of, although it really is around the, uh, the, the structure, you know, everything, the online checkout. There's a whole bunch of things that are better for the, the investors that are involved with that. Um, the second piece, uh, which is very interesting, is... Um, what will happen, especially when uh, people are using AngelList, and it, it's interesting. Some people use it just to fill out a round. Okay, I need a million and a half. I've got a million here. Let's get the other half. Other people use it to try to find specific kinds of investors to fill out a round. So, uh, like, uh, actually, I have to be careful because I don't know whether it was announced. Um, uh, one of our, our syndicate leads took a deal that uh, Kleiner Perkins had done the deal, John Durr went on the board, but uh, the syndicate lead in particular was very good at marketing, and so the company wanted him involved in the deal. So he gave him a 400K allocation into that deal. Those kinds of deals are not uncommon. They're a good portion of the deals that are flowing through. So the major investors, you know, Andreessen or whoever else, and then the syndic they want the syndicate lead involved and they want an allocation into it. So uh, that's a, a good piece of what flows through. So you can use AngelList and negatively signal. Um, it, you don't, going on AngelList is itself not a negative signal. It depends how you choose to use it. Yeah, so you can use it sort of like a seed fund. One really quick thing about AngelList that is very different from raising in the traditional way, which is very positive, is when you get an investment from a syndicate, like Gill Syndicate or Tim Syndicate, you have 100 people helping your company. They can repost job seeking things, they can retweet you, they can connect you into other corporations and whatever else. Compare that to working with a VC fund where you have one partner and maybe like three other partners sort of helping you out. This is like a big group of backers that can help you with all sorts of stuff. And that's, that's not right. something that can, you can do offline. That's something that you can uniquely do with an online platform. All right, so hopefully what we've been able to do is to kind of show you a new way for you as entrepreneurs to be thinking about raising capital when you leave here and go start your own companies. If you would all join me in thanking our guests for... Uh... <laughs>